I'll spend the next 15 minutes um, talking about sharing our experience in, um, in building uh, application, helping uh, users to uh, automate uh, their uh, release process. Um, the presentation goes as, as follows. I'll, um, I'm probably preaching to convert it here, but just to make sure we're on the same page or not, <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, I'll spend a bit of, of time uh, talking about uh, the, the problem domain, as the problem we're trying to, to solve. Then we'll go through um, some lessons learned from past experiences, um, uh, especially in using grid computing to do some of, of, uh, of the automation we're, we're doing. And then I'll hit the, um, perhaps the, the core of the talk, which is how um, we're using cl cloud computing and uh, the solutions and issues that uh, we found with this. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. So wh what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that uh, nowadays, um, still, uh, software or releasing software is, is risky, stressful, and expensive. And it's risky because, uh, unfortunately, we, we get it wrong often. A lot of software gets either the projects get canceled, uh, or they, uh, they don't make it in time. Um, or they, they exceed, uh, exceed cost uh, or, or, or uh, don't meet the expectation. And it's stressful, and then this is, uh, I mean, from my personal experience, if, we, if you walk around a, a software team about to release software, you can probably smell and taste the, uh, the, the stress, the level of, uh, of uh, uh, anxiety sometimes. And, and that's a moment where you probably want people to be very relaxed and make sure they don't introduce last minute problems into the, uh, the release process. And it's expensive because of all of this effort required and when you get it wrong then it costs uh, not only in, in, in money but also in, time, in terms of, a, of human uh, energy. And, and that's wrong. I don't think it, it is required to be, to be this way. So what can we do about that? So let's looking at, at the, um, some of the, the root cause. Um, as, as we're writing software, the, our, our environment, our target environment, or our user environment is, is often uh, heterogeneous, so we'll have to, uh, to tackle targeting different operating systems or different uh, flavors of, of, of the same operating systems, depending if our, if our application is end-to-end -end or it's taking part in a, in a more complex orchestration. Um, we need to understand how our software is, is going to be used and, and, and make sure we, we understand that. Uh, we're probably not writing software in a vacuum. So we might have software that's been released already in production that needs to be maintained. So we need to understand how that, that evolves. We have new stuff that is, is about to be released or, or we have new ideas we're, we're, we're working on. And all these pieces are in motion. And we need to understand and follow all of those. Um, in order, we were talking about confidence a little earlier and uh, it's very important that we understand and we have the right confidence in, in all of those moving pieces. The best way to do that is to test. Right? That's the best way to, 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 to gain the confidence. But then as, as we have all of those pieces uh, flying around, we, our, our needs for, for test bed, for, for a, an environment in which to test, starts to explode. And then we, we hit limitations. Uh, we had limitations in terms of, uh, of uh, sysadmins, so that are able to configure and reconfigure your, your test environment. And, and sometimes as well resources. How many machines do we have to actually uh, keep track with, with uh, what we're trying to do? And then we, when you start scaling up and, and hit the distributed systems or, or, or NT architectures, then, then it, gets, it gets even worse. And it's at that level, as, as this explosion starts, that the cloud is actually going to be useful. Another way of, of looking at this problem is, is the, uh, what we call the, the procurement hassle. We need to be able to, to find a problem and investigate a problem quickly and then have quick turnaround. Okay? So this, here's a little you know, example. Hey, boss, you know, we have a problem. And it could be anything like maybe there's a race condition that under certain circumstances will, will blow up or, or, or the performance is going to nosedive if, if these strange things happen together. And often the solution is, well, we need machines. Okay, so if you're lucky, the machine room has a few uh, idle machines that can be tapped at and configured and you're good to go. My experience is that it's rarely the case. Sorry. 
If you're lucky, there's a few boxes in the corner of the machine room that need to be unwrapped, <coughs> plug into the racks, configure it, powered up, you're good to go. It's more likely that you're going to have to go through a procurement, procurement loop, which means days, weeks, and months if you're not, uh, if you're not lucky. Which means that by the time that the machines or the tools are in place, either the problem is in production, or you spend a lot of time doing Gedenken experiments trying to figure out is it really a problem or not. All of this is a distraction from adding value to, 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 to the system being creative, and that's a risk. And, and on, on the other side, because it, it's, it takes so long to get, get hold of machines, even if you don't need them anymore, you hug them. You, know, you never know, we might actually need, need them in, uh, at a later date. And because if everybody starts to do that, then we end up with a slow, frustrating, uh, uncollaborative uh, and, wa and wasteful uh, way of, of, of doing things, and that, that is wrong. So to, to tackle some of that, uh, a lot of people have, um, have started to do automation, and then I think we're a good testimony of, of, of this. Um, and this is probably the order in which people tend to start their automation walk in, 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 uh, in life. So they start with a build, so they automate their build. There's no reason for not doing this anymore. There's loads of good tools to do that. Out there. Automate their unit tests. I'm not talking about capturing the unit test. I'm talking about the, the execution of, of, the, uh, of the process. Now you package your, uh, your, your software, you install it. Automatically, you make sure that you can actually not only package it, but the, the package will install. And as you go down, you, you want to start deploying those packages, configure them, put them into a, a system state. Uh, in the case of, a, of an NT architecture, a distributed system, then a, a N tier machines. And then once that is set up and working as a co coherent uh, system, then you want to test that. And these, as, as you go down that route, it, it becomes harder, because there are more pieces in motion. And it's those two or three last steps that, that uh, we uh, at Six Squared are, are interested in. So as it, as it's easy to, to do these things uh, at the class level, because your system at a class level is a very small system. As it, it gets bigger and there are more pieces, uh, it, it becomes much more difficult. A different way of looking at this um, is, is the, the team dynamics. When we talk about releasability, well, there's, there's um, in order to be at the end here, where we're, we're good to go, there's a lot of people that have contributed to this. You have your developers, your testers, your integrators, or certification people, your QA, and you probably have those actors, whether you have specialized teams or you have multidisciplinary teams, you're going to have those types. These types of knowledge exist, uh, I think, necessarily, in order to capture the different steps that will form your, your, your pipeline that will end up with something that you can put into production. So this, this release dynamics, uh, it comes back to, to it's, it's a complicated affair because there's a, uh, th this knowledge of, um, of releasability is spread a, 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 a across a large number of, um, of stakeholders. And as all of those pieces are in motion, we need to be able to capture this, this knowledge of releasability as, as time goes on. Um, however, if this knowledge is spread across, it often is uh, a small team or, or even an individual who actually will you know, press the, the red button and says, go, go into production. Okay. So we, we want to be able to, to kind of rationalize this, this, uh, this a little bit. So the, the ultimate goal is, is, uh, is, is a full system test automation. Okay. Um, with uh, the, the, the end result of being able to release with confidence. And this, this confidence, I think, is a very powerful word that, that captures well what, what we're trying to do. And here's a quote from uh, Peter Kvaris. I had the chance to, to work with Peter at the uh, Open Grid Forum. Uh, for uh, a couple of years. And here's a, a, a slide he presented, and I thought it was quite uh, appropriate to this, this talk. So, you know, automate, automate, automate. Humans are slow and expensive, not to mention unreliable and lazy. That's what makes us so much more fun than machines, but it cripples testing. Okay, I think, I thought it was, it was interesting. So, we have to be careful. So, lo looking at uh, some solutions from, from this, uh, this uh, very quick analysis, uh, what we want to do is, is be able to capture people's worries. 
know, all of these different, different actors that are contributing to this pipeline, we want to be able to capture this in, 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 in some, some form. And then automate that, that pipeline from a, a, a single button or a single trigger or, or whatever. Be able to say, are we able to go through the end of that, that arrow and are we able to release? Are we, are we able to, to go to production? Or if anything has been injected in this pipeline in, in, in the meantime, can we actually, you know, it, does it break that? And, and, and if it does, why? And, and let's, let's fix that. So the solution to this is, is both, it's, it's tooling, but it's also cultural. As soon as you talk about changing the way people, what process is about changing the, the way people do things, and there's a cultural effect that, that we, we need to understand and, and, and work with. Um, but as, as we go down the, uh, the evolution, you know, the arrow I was, I was showing going down, the tool support actually decreases. And this is, this is where we, uh, we, we, uh, we try to contribute. So I've described a little bit the, uh, the, problem, the, the problem that I'm, we're trying to, uh, to address. Um, now we'll, we'll start to, to look at how, how we do that. So this is us, uh, Six Squared. We're uh, a limited company based in, in Geneva, Switzerland. I took that picture from my office uh, just before we left. Uh, no, it's not true, it was raining. Um, <laughs> so we're trying to, um, to focus on, on that part where so few people are able to automate the, the installation, deployment, and system test part. And that's what our, the focus of, 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 uh, of our application development is, is, is at at the moment. Uh, and this is what I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with. Uh, before doing that, uh, for a, a couple of years before creating Six Squared, I worked at CERN on, on the ethics project, where we, um, it was funded by the European Commission. It's the equivalent of the NSF, uh, if you want, in, in, in the States. Um, where we, uh, we showed possible the vision that delivering a service, I mean a web service and a set of tools, is actually uh, a, a viable solution to automate that, that, that process. Okay, so it was done, so delivering a, service, a software as a service with a, a backend which would manage the resources for the users. So the users don't have to manage their own resource, we offer the resources as a, as a, as a service uh, and it was using a grid, grid middleware. And the best grid middleware for this, uh, uh, this project we found was Condor, it's developed by the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Peter Kouvaris is, is part, was part of that project with a, a layer on top called Metronome. So you would configure your um, your, your build process, you press a button and then the grid engine will actually deploy jobs and, and your, your, your build process and test uh, procedures would, would fire up in the background and you'd be told, you'd given a, a report uh, when, when this is finished. The main user of, uh, of, this, um, of this project, this build and test project, was the EGE project, or the Enabling Grid for eScience, probably the biggest uh, grid deployment, uh, at least public uh, academic uh, grid uh, deployment in the world. Um, there's a lot of numbers here, but you know, 250 sites, over 50 countries. This is an old slide, with you know 10,000 users, scientists grouped in, in 150 different co scientific collaboration, working together, sharing results, ideas, uh, data, uh, and, and resources. So uh, 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 a reasonably big uh, deployment, um, and it's used by by several different uh, scientific communities. And to power this grid. Um, the, uh, they, they used a, a software layer called GLite. So GLite is uh, it's about 300 components grouped in 20, th uh, 20 different subsystems, two million lines of code written in many language. Um, and the, uh, the build process, and, in, and, and another interesting aspect is there was like several dozens of developers all over the world contributing to this uh, middleware effort. And the, the build process was, that was captured in, in ethics, this project I was, I was mentioning where the, uh, the dependencies between different components and the grouping uh, were captured in a tool and then for every component, uh, the tool, the, the ethics tool would call out to make auto tools or, or, or end files to actually build the, the specific component and then generate the, the, the packages. Okay. So let's look at some of the lessons learned from using uh, this, this uh, grid middleware um, powered ethics tool applied to, to this project. Um, as, as we rolled in this, uh, this new process, um, we thought that simplicity matters. Okay? If it's not simple, it's not fun. 
Okay, it will be a distraction from what people are doing every day, um, and that, that so that people will will just resist. Okay, and speed matters as well, in the sense that everybody wants to I think recognize a contribute to a global effort to to streamline the overall process, but if it's too detrimental to their own work, if it slows them down too much, again, they'll start to, to, to resist that change. So it's important that they understand the, the global contribution, but it needs to pay off for them as well. So the return on investment from a personal level is, is important so that, you know, me included, I have a benefit from using a new, a, a new process. So that, that these were, were important uh, uh, lessons. Another project that, um, uh, I want to talk about briefly is uh, the diligent project used uh, ethics service as well to um, to automate but focus more on testing so diligent is a, is a digital library uh, built on top of the eg grid and it basically uh, create it uses the grid to build indexes so it basically just goes through a, a large set of, of, of rich documents and, and build indexes so that you can have quick queries uh, via a web form uh, online and it was using, as I said, the, 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 the Eggy grid behind to actually crunch through this, this data. So it's 40 different services sitting on five core services. Um, and it used ethics for, to automate its, um, its uh, deployment tests. So as every time they wanted to test a, a single service, now we're in system test mode, um, they needed to put the five core services in a certain state or at a certain version level. Okay, because all of those pieces are, are in motion and are being developed. So they had to kind of control and ask some sysadmins responsible for the testbed to put the testbed in a certain state so that they could test their, their, their service. And as this thing started to, um, to be tested in anger, then it overloaded very quickly the, uh, the people uh, dealing with the, 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 the five core services. Um, and that, that became uh, unmanageable. So we, we proposed to them to use the, um, this, uh, this, uh, this service to automate part of the, uh, the deployment of those core services, so that on demand, they could start to configure automatically the test bed so they could perform their system test on, on that. So what are the lessons learned from, from doing this? Um, I, I, by the way, I, I've put some references at the end, so if you want to have more information about those, those projects, you'll, you'll be able to, uh, to, to find that information. Um, something that, that is only natural and comes across often when you start to talk about automation, is that, yeah, but our software is not designed for automation. You know, it's just going to take too long. It's too expensive. We found out that uh, that was the case in this case. It was not thought. The software was not thought to be automated. But we started to see positive return on investment very quickly by automating a subset of th that deployment. So you don't have to be able to deploy the entire thing you know, from the word go to see positive return on investment. And that's interesting because it gives us a, a lower threshold, a, a cheaper way to start automating and see, and see, uh, see positive feedback. Um, we also seen that as, as you start to automatically deploy more than one machine, when things go wrong, then troubleshooting becomes tricky if you're not able to directly access the machine. Okay, so if you only, in the case of a, of a, of a grid environment where you only see uh, uh, your, your, your report coming back, the thing failed, and here are your logs. You don't go through your logs, try to figure out what's going on, and it's trial and error, and that can be time consuming. This was not possible because it's not a criticism on the Condor uh, middleware, it's, it's the way we used it. I'm sure there must be a, a different way to do that, but being able to actually get at the machine uh, would have been a time, a time saver. So, trying to analyze this uh, at uh, what I call the uh, sociology of automation. Um, I think industry and academia alike, I think consensus is much better than you know, your VP dropping a piano on your head from the fifth floor. At least that's the way it feels when it lands on your head. Um, no, this is the way we're going to do things and go. Okay, I think reaching consensus is a much more productive way to, to do things. Um, but we have to be careful about it. Okay, so we have to be as little intrusive as possible. And be clever about where we start to automate the process to, to show you know, a, a dramatic improvement very quickly so that people say, oh, that's interesting, that, that works for me. Yeah, it works for the better good of mankind, but it works for me, that's cool, I'm gonna keep on doing more of that, okay? Uh, and recognize the fact that depending on 
what's the, the context where you start working. Uh, if it's powered, you know, uh, the, the team is, is under a lot of pressure, fear exists, and fear of change is, is very powerful. You know, change is visible. You can always track down, oh, you took that decision six months ago. So people will just, whoa, you know, you asked me to do something different. Where status quo stealth, you know, someone else will, 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 will take that decision. And this is something we need to, to understand as, as, we, as, we, as we push these things uh, forward. The goal is to unchain creativity. Okay, maximize the amount of time we spend being creative. Uh, but there's a cost. The cost is to automate once and then maintaining it. And it's a non-zero cost, but the benefit is amazing. The benefit is we become creative again. We don't have to do all of these manual steps that we have to do every time. Then we get tired, we get it wrong, and then it creates a, a chain reaction of issues, especially as you get closer to the release date. Okay. So we want to abuse of the machines as much as possible. I think we're far from the silent revolution. And before the machines become self-aware, <laughs> we'll have other issues to treat. So we can keep on doing that for quite, quite a while. And as a you know, basic uh, agile principle, you know, we have to slow down to speed up. But we have to be careful not to slow down too, too much for too long and make sure that we show potential for speed up as soon as possible and then real speed up. Okay, and that takes and means courage. So we need to start little by little and in an incremental approach. Okay. And automate with the, the, the goal of, of reduce, reducing turbulence, making things easier and more fluid as, 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 we go, as we go along. And if it's not simple, it just won't work. So what's the scope? Well. Um, I think the scope is, is to get full benefit, is really to go from build, package, install, deploy, test in a synthetic environment. Synthetic in a, mean, a safe environment that will not cross-fertilize with a, an a, a already running system. Okay, we want that to be in a, in a safe bubble. But yet the, the environment needs to be as re representative as possible of, of your real production environment. And then, you know, so that means, means you want to do this as, as often as possible for you know, times uh, a series of releases or a series of, of pieces in motion, which means you're going to have many, many test beds. And that's where the cloud helps, because it's going to allow us to do, to do that uh, in, in, in an easy way. So I, I mentioned a little bit what the problem is, who we are, what we've done in the past you know, to, uh, to put us on, on, on the right track. And I'm going to talk about the cloud computing, how, how that specific uh, technology actually enables uh, and some of the issues, the, the, the test automation path. So cloud this year is the latest buzzword, and it's used to actually mean many things, which is great. You know, grid computing went into that in 2001, 2002 was a cool thing to be in, um, which, is, which is OK. Uh, and then we have a wide range of, of definitions. And I don't want to go into the semantic definition. That's not my thing. Um, when I say cloud, I mean Amazon, okay, the Amazon type of, of cloud, as opposed to, for example, an, another um, uh, definition would be maybe uh, the Google App Engine is, is often labeled under the, the, the cloud umbrella, but it, does, uh, it has a, a, a different take at it, and it's not necessarily appropriate to what uh, we're, we're trying to do. So it's not a criticism on, on Google App Engine. It's probably cool because there's Python under it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what we want is, is uh, uh, the reason why Amazon is, is uh, the Amazon Cloud is, is, is uh, interesting in this case, because we have uh, on-demand resources and storage. Okay? And the one of the reasons why it's so popular is ease of use. Okay? Cloud is delivering in this context because it's easy to use. It's easy to use because it, imp in, in it exposes its, its uh, a REST interface with HTTPS. And RESTful web services is just wonderful. Okay. If you haven't been across those, I, there's a reference at the end. It's a book from Ruby and Richardson. Um, it's, uh, it's, if, you, if you've suffered with DCOM and Corbin in the past, or, or big web services, or the SOAP-based web services, uh, you're going to find this refreshing, I hope. If not, then just give me a call. We'll talk about it. Anyway, so it's not the topic of this discussion, so I'll, I'll resist carrying on. Uh, but ease of use of the interface of the cloud uh, of Amazon is, is, is key in its, in its success. The other aspect of it is runtime, the runtime environment. Because it's using virtualization, 
and I resonate much, very much with uh, our, our keynote speaker this morning about the, 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 the keenness of virtualization. It provides hardware virtualization, which means it gives full control of the user. So the user has full control of their machine because they're virtualized. And that isolates completely the infrastructure providers from what the users are doing because there's this abstraction in between, the, the hypervisor that provides abstraction between the, the host and, and the uh, virtualized environment. And that is great because it, 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 it make, keeps both sides of, of, of the, the layer happy. And elasticity. Amazon has a pay-as-you-go uh, policy, so you, you, you only use what you need and you pay for only what you use. Okay? And, and this promise of elasticity comes from the fact that, in the case of Amazon, and there's others, there's like a GoGrid and there's a App Nexus, I think, that are in, in interesting in-betweens um, Amazon and, and, and the Google App Engine approach to, to cloud computing. But what, what they say is they, you know, use our stuff, we'll, we'll, we can buy hardware faster than, than you, which means that the, the system remains elastic. There's no concept of a, of a queue semantic in, in the system as, as a user. And that, that gets rid of a lot of the problems that we, we sometimes see in, in, in grid computing. Okay, so ease of use, virtualization, elasticity. These are the key features. Looking at the specific services that, um, that we're using, the first one is EC2, so it's the Elastic Computing Cloud. Um, so I said it, it was based on virtualization, it's actually using Zen at the moment, and it's interesting because now everybody's fighting uh, that, that part of the, the world. So uh, Microsoft apparently is about, is about to, to, to announce their, their new cloud solution. Uh, um, uh, Amazon is saying, ah, but we support uh, Windows as well, so we'll have to see how that works. Uh, but most of the, their stuff at the moment uh, is, is uh, it's, uh, it's based on, on Zen. Um, the user basically requests a virtual machine. So he says, I store their virtual machine, or the, they're, they're using a, a public available uh, virtual machine stored in, in, uh, in S3, the, the, the simple storage service I'll talk about in a minute. And then uh, the Amazon will just basically boot that machine for you. Voila. And if you configure it right, then you can actually log in as root, and then you're, you, you've got full control. Um, and you can use a, a REST or a SOAP interface to, to control that. The other service that we're using that's interesting in this context is the, the simple storage service. It's basically a very simple uh, hierarchical uh, uh, approach to storage with uh, they call buckets, so they're containers and objects. You can put ACLs and metadata on the objects. Um, and, and an interesting uh, service that came across uh, came came along this summer is the uh, Elastic Block Store, so that you can prepare data, and uh, the data that is stored in S3 can be actually mounted as a local disk into one of your uh, in instance. That's cool because if you have large data sets that are used in some of your tests, then you can decouple the image and the data. So you don't have to carry that data with every image you want. You can actually compose that at runtime. So that's interesting. So um, why is, is, is this an enabler for, for what we're, we're doing? Well, virtualization, as I said, provides the, 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 the clean layer, which means for maybe the first time, uh, the user has really full control over their, their user environment through a managed service. So they don't have to control the hardware, but they have full control once, once they're running, and that's, that's nice. Um, but it, it, it also means that the, uh, the new building block, when you're deploying your, your, uh, your, your composing and you're building your, 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 uh, your system, at runtime is, is, a, is a virtual image. So that's, that's your uh, new building block. The pay-as-you-go uh, approach is interesting because it means you can start, can start slowly. And as your, your need increase in terms of richness of scenarios or specific need for, you know, there's a, we've got a good problem, boss, we have, we have a problem. Then you can actually uh, request uh, the, the resources as you need. <coughs> Going back to the ease of use and the, the, the interesting technical, technological choices that Amazon made is that uh, they use REST and REST is HTTP, that's the language of the web. So you end up having a, a very simple way to integrate that service with existing services, which is one of the reasons, for example, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you have uh, plugins in, in Firefox that allows you to start, stop, monitor, uh, even log in into a, a machine and, and follow, uh, follow on what's, what's going on. And all, all of that is possible because 
they made a right choice of exposing their services with, <coughs> through, through HTTP. Which means when you start to integrate this type of technology into an existing process, you don't have to take on the world, you don't have to take everything on its head. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not viral. And then something we suffered in the, in the diligent project when something went, goes, goes wrong uh, during your deployment, it's okay, you just freeze your deployment, you can log in and then investigate directly your live system uh, and trace through uh, as you go along. And lastly, that means that now we've freed up the, uh, the development team from having to manage their own test infrastructure. Not only that, it's an elastic infrastructure, so it can grow and shrink as, as, as you need it. So, a, um, a more uh, complex solution would, would include uh, the ability to, um, to capture the image composition. So create a, a language so that you can capture the generation of your images and parameterize your deployment so they become reusable building blocks. So we want to be able to capture a recipe to build your images and build your deployments. Um, and here's a, uh, uh, the same image I, I showed before, but this time showing a little bit the process I'm, I'm, uh, we're proposing, where as we go through the, the, the process, we're able to now save stage. So source code becomes packages, becomes vir and then added with uh, an installation procedure, we can generate automatically virtual images. We can parameterize a deployment and then compose those images into a deployment model that can be executed. And you can fire system tests at that get the results and then release the machines uh, when, when, you're, when you're finished. So looking at it in, in uh, I'm running slightly late, so I'm gonna, gonna speed up a bit. Looking at how it would work in, 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 uh, in real life, uh, you would basically create what I call a, a little bubble inside, um, inside the cloud where you deploy your machines, they do whatever they want. Um, during that time, you can deploy a, a, a variation of this, uh, of this deployment in parallel. Uh, one is finished, so it gets re recycled, the machine go away to be used uh, another day. Uh, at the same time, you could have a completely different uh, deployment scenario running in parallel uh, on demand. What's interesting here is that all of those deployments are isolated, yet they're in a, a representative environment, okay? And resources are only used when they need, they need it. And at the end, just things, things go away. If we have a quick look at what could happen what might happen inside one of those bubbles, depending if, you, if your software is, is designed to actually come up from the ground, from, from, from zero up on its own uh, or not, we have a very simple API that allows you to actually synchronize things. So that if, say, you have a test suite that relies as a dependency, a runtime dependency on a service, that service has a dependency on a database, or you want to make sure the database up before the service comes up, before the test suite can fire, okay? So the, the um, our API will, will, uh, will make sure that the synchronization takes place so that the services wait for each other before they're, they're, they're authorized to fully configure uh, and execute. And once the test suite is finished, it says, okay, I'm good to go. We wrap up. And the, 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 uh, the, the report is, is sent back to the user. So it's not all uh, wide and fluffy. There are some issues. Um, Amazon is using Zen uh, for its virtualization technology, and Zen is para vir virtualization as opposed to full virtualization, which means the virtualized OS is actually made aware of being virtualized, okay? Uh, which means there are constraints on, on the type of, of, uh, of kernel supports that, that you can do. And as you start to, to play with virtual images, because it's so easy to bake new images, you can easily get overwhelmed with, ooh, uh, what's this one made of, and what's the difference between this one and this one? So that, that can actually become, uh, become uh, uh, confusing. That's, that's Seattle, by the way. Um, so the silver lining, um, well, virtualization technology, there's a new kid on the block called KVM that provides full virtualization so that you don't have to tweak your, your, your uh, OS being virtualized. However, it requires some uh, hardware extensions uh, in, the, in the chipset. But Intel and AMD have recognized that and are rolling out new, new chips now that have this, these extensions. So as time goes, uh, I think we're going to see a shift between, uh, at least uh, from, I'm, I hope, from Amazon as well, that we're going to go for, from uh, prior virtualization to full virtualization. And for, for the virtualization image proliferation problem, the idea is to, as, as we're proposing, 
is to create uh, those images from, from high-level metadata so that a human can read the recipe that is used to generate a, a, a virtual image, so can a computer, so can a, a program. And then that, that um, I could alleviate the, the, this problem. So I've spoken a lot about the actual Amazon service, but what's actually more exciting than the, the commercial service that Amazon proposes is the technical technological, technological, sorry, choices that they made behind, they, 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 they took behind. Uh, and talking about this to some, uh, some, some potential users and customers, some are feeling a bit um, uh, cagey about having their, you know, trade secrets running on a foreign network. So there is a need for um, perhaps standardizing or, or, or you know, learning from the Amazon experience and then allow making it more, more easier to, um, for people to roll out their private cloud, their, what I call it, an inner cloud. So it's really a call out for open source distribution and open source implementation of these types of technologies so can, we can more easily reuse this type of, of, of technology into our, our process automation. So as conclusions, um, I hope I've uh, convinced you that it, it is possible nowadays uh, to, uh, to, to automate a full-scale system testing from build, package, deploy, and system test. Uh, it's a bit more difficult than unit testing, but it's, it's well worth it. And some of the, the, the benefits uh, we see is a uh, lower stress uh, level and, and turbulence during the uh, software release cycles. Okay. Uh, by doing more automation at that level and, and m more of, of the entire cycle, we keep you humans more creative, that's very important. And then we, that means we get the machines to do what they're good at. Um, and this is possible by a fusion of, of cloud computing and, and the right framework and management layer on top. And I think it's Eric Gama who talked about test infection. Uh, I'm very much test infected. But with this, it means the test infection deepens because now it's, it's, it's including more of, of, of the release process. So here are the references I, uh, I promised. I just want to quickly acknowledge the work of, of Peter Covaris, I, I mentioned him already, and Guillermo Diaz and Pedro Andrade were working uh, with me on the Diligent uh, project in uh, two summers ago. Uh, we did this work that actually showed, up, showed that it's possible to use these types of, 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 uh, of technologies uh, to show positive benefits uh, uh, at, at the system test level. So I'm very glad and happy that we did that work together. We're, we're using this today. With this, uh, in my name and, and, and Cal's name, um, well, thank you very much for, for listening. I think I've been, I've been authorized to take a few questions, so fire at will. Yes? Uh, just go back to the, the private cloud or the inner cloud. Yeah. How far in pro do you know of projects that are out there that are being worked on, or how far has that come, or pieces in place? I, 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 I wish I, I could be more open about this. We, we're discussing uh, this with a few partners to team up to actually provide those types of interface. We haven't firmed up those, uh, those collaborations yet. So there are a few things, but it's not like take and run with it. So just, I'm working on kind of that project internally right now. Okay. On a smaller scale. So it's well, I, let's, have a, let's have a drink after that. We'll tell you where, where we are. But I just want to be a bit careful about, about this. But there, there are some interesting work going on. Um, eventually, what we would like is, is really to, for people to focus on not necessarily exactly the Amazon interface, but that level of semantic and that level of, of, of offering so that we don't have to rewrite our app every time the cloud change. But uh, there, there's some, some stuff happening there as well. Other questions? Yes, at the back. Well, that's a great question. So the question is, the background is about cost of Amazon, uh, the fact that if you, uh, it's, so, just, and, and how do you, it's like the, the original uh, mobile phone uh, uh, contract. So you were, you, you would, you know, you talk five seconds, you're, you, you're charged a minute. 
And at the moment, it's a bit the same. You charge per hour. So for a small instance, it's 10 cents, 10 US cents. Um, so it's 72 bucks per month for, for one machine full time, a small instance. And then you have different types of, of instance with more cores, more memory, and so on. Um, it, it's a problem. And then we actually are hitting that as, as, you, as, we, as we get our, our, our tests that are much more performant and so on, uh, you end up having uh, idle, idle time from, from, uh, on the Amazon side that, that uh, you, we would like to reduce to uh, be, be, be paying for, per, per second or, or per fraction of minutes. So what you could do is you, you could reuse um, some of that time uh, to actually restart a machine that doesn't restart a counter. Uh, and then put it in a different state and then, and then carry on. That's something you could do. We don't at this point in time. We say, well, we, we bite it and say it's going to cost you 10 cents to start a machine, whether you use it for one or, or 59 minutes. But I mean, personally, I think it's something that I'd like to, uh, to see go away. Yeah. Did I, did Well, it's the flexibility is that I can say, for this minute, I want that image, that di this storage, this context. You now, the minute after, I just forget it. I want uh, these five machines together. Then the minute after, well, I want to rerun that thing, but I don't want one client. I want a thousand clients because I've got this race condition I want to explore. It's this flexibility that uh, you need virtualization and you need a service in front of that with, with the elasticity, elasticity I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was giving you. Yes? Respond to him and then ask a question. Sure. Um, I had dinner with a friend last week, and what he was interested for is the performance testing against his in house system because he can bring those systems up for an hour, attack the hell out of his system in house, pay for, you know, pay a quarter for that, all that capacity that he needs, which is like a couple bucks, right? He uses it for an hour, <coughs> turns it off, and he doesn't use it again until he needs it again. So, That good, good point. I agree completely with. I don't know if you got that, but yeah. yeah. My question for you is: Is there in the? I work with VMware a lot. Um, is is there a higher level of aggregation of groups of systems in this EC2? I mean, in, in a multi-tier system, you want to bring up five systems all together and you want to treat them as a group. Do I do I have to concurrently write scripting with that, or can I just say this is a group? It's it's been it's been a startup in this order, so all this. Uh, so you can say, uh, I want five machines, like, like uh, what well, you want? I want to say, I have five machines. They have, uh, they have this startup dependency. You know, the database got to come up first. Okay. And yeah, so the question is, can, time yeah. so the question is can, we, can we bring those machines together as a group, and then can we control the order in which they come up, right? Yeah, so and also, the, can you talk about the networking? Because you know, when you have machines that are cross-configured like that, they have internal state dependencies to each other. Yeah. Can they then be replicated and those state dependencies isolated from another group that has that? So when you start in Amazon uh, machines together, you, you, can, you have control over the network uh, configuration, well, at a certain level, the network configuration of those machines. So you can tell which one will see uh, which ones and, 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 and so on. You can also uh, provide external vis visibility, so only one of those machines is, is externally visible. There is no such thing as, as uh, in the Amazon interface to control the dependencies between those machines as part of the same instantiation process. And this is where our tools come in uh, that are as little intrusive as possible to say, you know, in, in, in the boot up sequence, uh, we, we try to be as, as, uh, as light as possible to allow this use case I was describing to say, make sure that the test suite fires up only after the services that, that need to uh, have been fired up, and then exchange the minimum amount of, of, meta, uh, of meta information between those uh, so that the test suite will find the service and the service will find the database, because all of that is dynamic. We can't predict upfront the, uh, the, the names. There's a service uh, called uh, Elastic IP, uh, so that you have a, a pool of, of, of fixed IP that you can, ass you can assign. Um, but in, in a dynamic uh, way, of, uh, when you're in a dynamic environment where you're deploying a lot of those machines, you would, you would starve your, your, your static IPs. So that's where there's a, a requirement for uh, a set of, of, of lightweight services that sit on top of, of cloud to manage 
bringing your system from, from nothing to a, a running system. So it's a combination of, the, of those two things. Did that answer your question? Pretty much. I'll get With pleasure. Thank you. Yes, in the back. OK, um, I, I didn't mention that, but just before leaving, leaving CERN, I wrote a comparative study between grid and cloud. And I, 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 um, it's, in, it's on our website. There's, there's a, a link to, to this uh, comparative study. I'm at, I've, I've tried to bring um, uh, different uh, information I could find. Uh, one of them is an interesting section uh, in, in, this, uh, in this report on, on performance. The, uh, the Amazon is using a strange, uh, a strange uh, unit, uh, compute, u compute unit, to, to guide the user in their choice of, of, of instances. I mentioned Tencent is a simple instance. Then you have uh, larger, uh, larger instances and so on. So that, that defines the, the promised uh, uh, performance profile of that machine. Okay? But um, in terms of networking, we have very little information about how Amazon is putting their, 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 uh, their back end together. We know that from reverse engineering and doing, uh, doing uh, uh, black box experiments, that their data farm and their, their server farms are separate. If you start two uh, or, or several images together, you're likely to have a close proximity network-wise, and you, can, you get more or less one gigabit per second connectivity between those instances, and, and a little less between the, the, the storage farm and so on. So the performance is, is good, OK? Uh, Assuming that, that, that you, you accept the, uh, the, 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 the configuration choices they made, uh, the way they, 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 deal, they, they deal with storage and, and, and compute. OK, thank you. Yeah. Wow, I've <laughs> I'll never make it to the coffee. No, no, it's fine. let's have a coffee and then we talk. Other questions? No, is that it? Okay, thank you.